We start the first panel. I would like to introduce um, the speakers. Uh, Zaid Hanin, uh, Professor Zaid Hanin, teaches at Bariel University, uh, but also uh, at Barman University in Israel. Uh, and also is the chief scientist uh, at the Ministry of uh, Integration and absorption. Alia and integration. Yes. Alia and integration. And well, uh, uh, absorption will uh, pass away. It's yeah, about, right, right. right. Multicultural yes. you know, so integration. Yeah, in the state of Israel. And uh, Eva Bekjin uh, from the Yagdalonian University in Poland. Uh, so the first presentation. Uh, by Zaid Hani is uh, Israel as an East European country, civic, political, and geostrategical dimensions. Please, Zaid. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for organizing this event. I would like to come back for a second to our fascinating lecture of Alan uh, and our discussion what Israel studies should be and how it should be defined uh, by saying that uh, uh, we have. Quite frequently, we come across the situation when Israel studies is attached to the Oriental studies. And uh, uh, from this point of view, many believe that uh, in case it is not just Jewish studies, it is not just history, but a certain discipline, in case we would like to append it to this or that way, in this or that way, to any region, so it should be <coughs> Middle East, as if it's in the Middle East, and in this case, it should be part of the Orientalism. Or Oriental studies. I would like to argue in this presentation that if so, we should just think about the European option rather than the Middle Eastern option. And uh, I would like to try to prove it uh, by addressing to uh, sorry, excuse me, by addressing to a few points, uh, four objectives. Uh, what Israel in fact is. Uh, is. Uh, first of all, what are the civilization rules of Israeli government and politics? Second, uh, say this aside, I'm sorry. Second question, uh, what uh, uh, can we say that Israeli political culture uh, is Middle Eastern, European, or as I would argue, uh, uh, East European, first of all. Uh, second, uh, the demographic factor. It's uh, sometimes we are talking about culture, about history, about uh, heritage, about other issues, but probably it would be worthwhile to have a look at what is the composition of Israeli population. And that will probably explain ours a lot. And uh, then uh, uh, the issue which we are not going to discuss now because tomorrow we will have a special presentation about that, uh, which is actually the result of impact of these historical roots and civilizational roots of Israeli state and society, which at the end of the day uh, bring our state to what, where it should be, you know, to cooperate much more in the new, uh, on new all democracies of the East Central Europe and uh, uh, to feel much more a part of the European community and European family rather than uh, uh, our ge geographical position in the Middle East. And finally, uh, Israel is also in, for Eastern Europe as a symbol. Uh, it's a symbol of uh, success, it is a symbol of uh, problems uh, and challenges uh, uh, which are pretty similar to what many of new old democracies, including Ukraine uh, in Eastern Europe, enjoy at the moment, enjoy in uh, both meaning of this word. And uh, uh, finally, uh, we can address to certain allusions, meaning whether Israeli experience should be learned also not as a symbol, but also as a solution. So let's start from the very beginning. Uh, probably all of you know that uh, uh, despite of the fact that geologically uh, or geographically Israel is in Asia and geologically Israel is in Africa, so we are, uh, uh, Israel as a state, as a country, is situated westward from the, uh, um, uh, from, uh, uh, 
the Syrian stream, and that is why we are part of the African continent. Despite all this, that is why I'm teaching both African politics and Israeli politics. Uh, when, when some people ask me why I'm doing that, I say both Africa and Israel are ethnic oriental countries. So, uh, um, uh, uh, but uh, uh, in spite of this, I would also say that the uh, roots of Israeli uh, uh, state and society and civilization, which Israel belongs, Jewish civilization, is actually not exactly oriental. Uh, of course, their roots, their civilizational roots, are uh, in the Eastern Mediterranean. But whether, it's a good question whether we should define the Eastern Mediterranean as a part of the Asia or one of the sources, together with, of course, with the uh, 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 Greek and Roman civilization, a part of the contemporary uh, uh, European culture and European civilization. Uh, in fact, uh, when people say about uh, 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 Christian Jewish civilization, it's not just figure of speech in my mind. And yeah, that's exactly what we should talk about. Uh, 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 second issue, uh, we will address for that. We might say that uh, from this point of view, the whole discussion of the Zionist movement, what are, what the Jews are, whether they are uh, Asians of Europe or Europeans of Asia, uh, to my mind should be more addressed or more accepted uh, with the second point. I believe that they are Europeans of Asia, but actually Europe, uh, uh, they belong to that part of Asia where Europe started. Uh, and uh, 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 from this point of view, I would say that Israel is actually a much more European uh, than Oriental country. Uh, still, uh, I would also say that it's not just uh, European, but exactly East European. Uh, I believe that if we will address to the history of the Zionist movement, uh, which started as the part of the European national movements, uh, with some uh, uh, special uh, 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 inclinations, meaning that uh, opposite to what we saw uh, in Poland, in Czechia, in Slovakia, uh, or while we are talking about G German nationalism or Italian nationalism, uh, uh, the elites or intellectual and political elites of this movement were able to realize uh, their ideas uh, in the places where they people live. Uh, in the Jewish case, we had to uh, do one more step before, uh, meaning to come back to our historical motherland. But from this point of view, uh, uh, this is not much different from what from the experience of the German people, uh, French people, or Italian people, which had to come through the process of internal acculturation, uh, as anthropologists would say, or uh, experience of Poles or Czechs or Hungarians, which had to uh, uh, first um, uh, um, gain their independence from the empires or Ukrainians. Let's sort of mean the same people, right? In this case. Uh, uh, but uh, from this point of view, the Jewish experience is not much different. Uh, that is why probably we can, uh, this is also the way to uh, answer the question which was asked by you or, uh, uh, or uh, other colleagues, uh, uh, what's the difference between uh, teaching uh, Israel studies and uh, uh, other um, uh, area or uh, country studies. Uh, meaning that uh, uh, the, the easiest answer to my mind is that Israel is not a colonial project. Uh, Israel is a result of a uh, uh, national liberation movement which had to do uh, one step before uh, proclaiming its own state, meaning concentrating, as I said, uh, in the historical motherland. From, from this point of view, it's not a colonial project. That's a result of the national liberation movement, exactly as, as it was done by Ukrainians, Polchecks, or uh, Hungarians. Um, uh, uh, well, um, uh, uh, if we will come back to, uh, if we will uh, uh, go to, to the second issue, what are the roots of Israeli uh, um, uh, political culture, uh, normally we are talking about three major elements. One element is actually East European element, uh, meaning that the majority of Israeli political uh, and social and cultural elite uh, have the East European origin. I'm sure that in this audience I don't have any need to explain specifically how it comes. Uh, uh, all the overwhelming uh, the majority of the political norms, of the culture norms, of the social norms have East European origin. Most of Israeli historical political parties, they are elder than the state of Israel. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, two, two years ago, uh, the Labour Party uh, was proud to uh, 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 
celebrate. To celebrate, yeah, thank you. Uh, what was proud to, proud to celebrate its uh, 110 years from its founding, you know. Uh, the late, uh, the, the Likud party uh, was established, in fact, uh, as a revisionist movement uh, uh, in 1923. Uh, and uh, as well as the Poilet's own predecessor of the Labour Party in 1906 in uh, Poltava, you know, uh, in Ukraine, and so on and so forth. Uh, uh, starting from the theatre, Gabima Theatre, and finishing with the educational system, everything is actually uh, rooted here uh, in the Eastern Europe. Uh, if we will start the uh, foundation from the foundation of the Israeli economy, the Eastern Root Movement, and the way uh, how to uh, uh, how the, uh, the model uh, of the uh, moral economy, uh, uh, like we put it here, uh, should be developed and should be established, that also comes back to the uh, social democratic movements of the Eastern Europe. Uh, in much more, uh, in, in a uh, more substantial way uh, than uh, it, it, it could be related to, for instance, to the Central or West European or North American experience. And of course, the Oriental experience has nothing to do with that. Uh, um, then we will may, may say that uh, this element, actually, the East European element or liberal <coughs> East European origin, are in fact where the leading force of the so called practical Zionism which at the end of the day uh, came to power uh, in the state of Israel and many believe that they still are there, uh, despite of the fact that uh, uh, Israel, of course, uh, had its uh, transformation uh, from, uh, came through the transformation from the so-called uh, 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 soft authoritarianism uh, to contemporary liberal democracy. But still the Ashkenazi, East European Ashkenazi, uh, uh, ruling elite, uh, uh, educational, uh, uh, intellectual, political, in some way military and even religious uh, is something which uh, poses the tone in, in contemporary Israeli political and social culture. Uh, another element uh, is actually the, uh, uh, I would say, the Western element, the Atlantic element. Uh, North, uh, North America and Western Europe, uh, they made their impact on Israeli uh, uh, state and society uh, and Israeli political culture, but in a way that it pro um, pro provided some framework uh, for these East European elements that are still, to my mind, dominant uh, into the polit in political behavior, uh, in the political understanding, and uh, certain symbols which come back to the East European roots of Israeli society and state. Um, one of these elements are actually uh, so-called sectarianism. Uh, um, uh, 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 I, 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 would, I would say that uh, on one hand we could found, we could come across the sectarianism in majority of uh, contemporary states, including the Western states. For instance, in Finland, uh, we have uh, uh, like uh, uh, political parties, or in some other European countries, we have political parties like Great Britain uh, that uh, uh, provide that are provided with the core of their supporters for the certain ethnic groups. Uh, but in Israel, uh, but in Europe, uh, we understand it now as the part of the local multiculturalism within the so-called uh, civic nation. In Israel, we still have the idea of uh, uh, so-called ethnic nationalism. And within this ethnic nationalism, within this Jewish group, uh, which is this uh, so-called, uh, which is probably not only demographic, demographically uh, dominant, but also intellectual and ideological dominant, uh, we, we see the, our Israeli form of multiculturalism. And this multiculturalism within the Jewish collective, they also provide uh, the background and the basis uh, for various political uh, political movements which are defined as the sectarian movements. Um, it's, it's always a question, and coming back to uh, Alan's lecture, uh, whether we should, uh, as we quite often do, uh, while discussing the Israeli issues in different panels <coughs> and conferences, and uh, address uh, to various groups and to various sectors of the, the Israeli society. Uh, and quite often uh, 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 the flow is given to somebody who is talk talking about Ashkenazim and somebody who is talking about Mizrahim, that means Oriental Jews, and then to Arabs, and now we are, we are talking about Russians. Uh, so whether we, have to, we should talk about Russians after Arabs, not the question who, who is coming the first. The question is that Arabs in Israel are actually a separate ethnic national group 
and Russians or Russian-speaking Jews should be defined within the uh, Israeli collective, you know, Jewish collective, as a part of the titular nation. Uh, but still, uh, this multicultural approach uh, uh, brings us to understanding where it comes from. It comes from this certain East European idea uh, that it could be different within something uh, unified. And uh, Israel actually inherited that. It inherited uh, that, to my mind, uh, from Eastern Europe. At the moment, uh, as you can see here uh, in this picture, uh, uh, in, uh, we have like uh, 35, 74.5% uh, uh, of Israeli population is actually Jewish population. Among them, between 35 and 40% are people with East European roots. Uh, meaning that it's from uh, uh, probably one third or even more uh, of the Israeli population. Uh, naturally, uh, a, well, a, a substantial part of this group uh, do not define, the, they define themselves as East Europeans. Uh, they normally define themselves as Israelis. Still, uh, that what happened until uh, quite recently. Um, at the moment, we live in the postmodern situation when it is not enough to be just Israeli. In order to feel Israeli, like a noble Israeli, you should be Israel plus, meaning that you treat Israeli as something else. That is why quite a number of these people who are descendants of the first, second, third, and fourth Aliyah of the late 19th, early 20th century, and now they are looking for uh, their roots. Tiyule Shorashim, you know, uh, in search of their roots, uh, visiting East European countries, getting uh, East, uh, passports of Poland, uh, Germany, uh, uh, Lithuania. Uh, uh, Latvia, Romania, and so on and so forth, not because of the desire uh, to emigrate uh, uh, to Europe, but mostly because of understanding that it's not enough for you to be just as great. Uh, we have, uh, like, how, how many, uh, uh, you probably know about a long list of seminars uh, in Tel Aviv where uh, children, grandchildren, and grand, grand, grandchildren of uh, uh, the founding generation of the state of Israel, they are coming back to study Yiddish. Uh, because if you have uh, Russian Israelis, and you have Oriental Israelis, and you have English-speaking Israelis, so the good question, uh, what, uh, how uh, a person whose grand-grandfather uh, came back from Lithuania uh, should feel, how it should define and explain itself. That's the, uh, probably the reason of uh, growing interest to East European Yiddishism. Uh, that was a very interesting discussion between me and my uh, third cousin, whose name is Dov Hanin. Uh, our, his grand-grandfather and my grand-grandfather were brothers uh, and uh, lived in a small Lithuanian <coughs> settlement uh, somewhere uh, at the very end of 19th and early 20th century. His grandfather came to Israel as a religious Zionist that is why he's a communist at the moment. Okay? My grandfather, his uh, grand grandfather, stayed in Lithuania and then moved to Ukraine uh, because he was a communist. That is why I had to become religious Zionist. Uh, so, uh, 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 telling all this into account, we probably understand that at the moment the East European groups uh, of Israeli uh, society, or a substantial part uh, of the Israeli society. That's important not just as a symbol, but something that helps uh, uh, a, to a substantial number of the Israelis to reconsider, to uh, revoke, and to understand uh, again uh, their place in the contemporary postmodern uh, Israeli society. Um, if we will say a word about uh,
Do we see it here? No. So let's have a look at this. Uh, uh, all what I'm talking about could be just a question, of, uh, a subject of history. Uh, but uh, what happened about 30 years ago is actually the great wave of immigration of Jewish Aliyah uh, from the former Soviet Union. Uh, uh, if you will have a look at this, uh, at this slide, you will see that in the course of the, historic, uh, of the history of Aliyah uh, to the state of Israel, we have uh, uh, different waves. Uh, probably many of you remember famous Vysotsky song, Tam ne chetver bivše nasnarov. It's a quarter of that part. Uh, a, 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 a quarter of that people are actually uh, a former of ours, but in fact that really for the first time, and for the first and the last time, happened in the 1990s, when really Israel got an influx of immigration from the former Soviet Union, which at that time composed about 23, 24, 23, 24 percent uh, of the uh, Israeli uh, of the Israeli population, um, uh, what that helped us uh, at the moment, uh, as you can see, uh, those who came uh, from the former Soviet Union, uh, uh, which is actually uh, uh, at the moment is a, uh, about three quarter uh, of the immigration from Israel of the recent 28, 29, about 30 years. Uh, well, and. Uh, 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 currently, uh, we got from there uh, much more than uh, a bit more than one million people. Uh, among them, still 900,000 of them still alive. Uh, and if we will add to that about 240, 250,000 people who were born uh, in Israel uh, in the families, who were both parents actually by themselves are uh, originally from the former Soviet Union and from the USSR, you still understand that this uh, Russian speaking or Russian culture or Russian oriented, Russian in uh, quotation marks, it could be Uzbekian, it could be Ukrainian, but mainly of course that's Russia and Ukraine and Belarus, the Slavic republics of the former Soviet Union as well as Baltic states and some other places are still becoming the enriching, they, again, they're supporting uh, this uh, uh, revival of interest to the East European roots and cultural roots and culture elements and elements, uh, East European elements of Israeli political culture that always were there. However, at the moment, it's in a much more uh, uh, substantial, much more substantial way. Um, well, um, uh, still this group of people uh, uh, they enjoy uh, the sort of combination of Israeli culture, uh, meaning Israeli-Russian culture. Uh, of, of course, I understand that I'm in Ukraine and it could be a question why we should explain uh, all those who came from different republics of the former Soviet Union, including from Ukraine, the part of, uh, of Israel-Russia. Okay, that happens. In Eastern Europe, as we know, uh, we have a, a divergence of uh, East European Ashkenazi Jewry and establishment of new ethnic uh, Jewish sub-ethnic groups, meaning Ukrainian Jewry, Kazakh Jewry, Belarusian Jewry, Russian Jewry. In Israel, we have a conversion. In fact, uh, we know quite a few people who, start, who spoke Ukrainian who started speak Russian only in Israel. So, uh, and that happens also for many people uh, coming from other places. Uh, at the moment, we, are, we, we have a substantial group of Israeli population, about one million people, or even more, that feel to be a part and are a part of the Israeli Jewish collective, but still enjoy certain of the cultural, Russian Jewish cultural Israeli background, which is stressed on the world Jewish Israeli. Uh, Russian in this case means not ethnicity, but a culture background, as I said. And this culture background has the implications also in the political field meaning the establishment of political parties, that uh, most uh, voters come from a certain group, uh, uh, norms of political behavior, understanding uh, how it should be, and so on. The question is whether in this generation, or it could continue also in the uh, future generations. Uh, 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 if you will have a look at the interest in the Russian media, that probably it, uh, will survive at least until the middle of this, uh, 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 of this century. Uh, uh, have a look, for example, at uh, people who came uh, and, uh, representatives of the second generation and so-called one and a half generation. That means those who came uh, to Israel uh, before the age of 17. Uh, you see here 
that uh, um, in the parallel uh, with the so-called first in, uh, generation of immigrants that believe that uh, uh, they totally belong to Israeli-Russian entity. Uh, many of those who, who were brought to Israel as, a, as children or were born in Israel, they believe that it really depends on the situation. Very postmodern answer. Do you believe that you are a part of the Israeli-Russian community? Because it depends whom I'm talking about, with whom I'm discussing the issue, and uh, what is the political and social context. Uh, most probably when I'm asked this in London, who are, uh, who are you? I would say Israel, full stop. But when I'm asked in Israel, I might say Russia. Everybody understands what does it mean, yeah? But if I'm in Eastern Europe, I would say Israel, Russia, or Russian Israeli. And that even what is going to, to continue probably in this current generation. Uh, uh, from the other points of view, Israeli-Russian community is not different uh, uh, from the other groups in the Israeli population, just to give you an example, uh, the uh, ideological and political division within the Russian-speaking community, despite uh, 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 the mythology, myth uh, that all Russian speakers in Israel are on extreme right, uh, and so on and so forth, uh, you can see that it's not much different from, from the rest of the groups of the Israeli population, but still some elements of East European culture are still there. For instance, the question whether somebody should be granted citizenship without being loyal to the state, the uh, Russian-speaking Israelis say no. Israel is the Jewish state, full stop. That's it. The, the, there, there is no on the, on the other hand, and let us take into account, no on the other hand. Israel is a Jewish state. No citizenship without loyalty to the Jewish state. Some say that it's very Israeli, and some say that it's very East European, uh, or uh, European nationalist. But this question that should be, that need to be uh, uh, discussed. Uh, does it really mean, and now I'm coming back to the final question uh, of my discussion, um, that what, uh, does it mean that we have a Russian ghetto or East European ghetto or new one? Uh, in Israel, which means that Israeli, uh, a specific form of Israeli um, uh, multiculturalism within the Jewish collective, is transforming into something very much European, West European, meaning uh, civic society and civil society, with, uh, uh, which is based on the idea of, uh, uh, civil, uh, of civic nationalism, uh, and each group is actually represented as a separate national or ethnic national group. Uh, I would say that not. Uh, a good indication, I would say, uh, is uh, uh, the fact in what way those who came from Eastern Europe, and especially in the recent 30 years, how they understand uh, 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 the, the, the way of cooperating or relations between the state of Israel, their state, you know, which they belong to, uh, which they identify with, uh, with their host countries, many countries they came from, countries of their origin. Uh, you can see here, oh, I'm sorry, I have it in Please Russian, okay. uh, that uh, 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 about a half of those who came from the FSU, they believe that uh, uh, Russia should not capture uh, the position of the major strategic partner of Israel. So some of them believe that many uh, that it should be a, a sort of cooperation between Russia, Ukraine, and some other FSU countries. But of course, not the expense of the special uh, relations with the United States. Um, uh, uh, and uh, it, it makes no difference uh, whether uh, whether uh, uh, respondents came uh, in the early 1990s or are coming in the recent couple of years. Uh, and the, the same we can say in the concern of the generation issue. Uh, a overwhelming majority of those who, who uh, came uh, uh, also at the age of 45 plus are not much different uh, uh, from those who are actually come from uh, when they were very, very young. You know, uh, it is uh, well to think that those who, as the younger person uh, makes aliyah, the more Israeli devoted uh, his political or his world vision is. Uh, still, we, we can see here uh, that from this point of view, whether uh, we are Israelis or uh, those who are happen to live in Israel, but mentally and politically we are still there, uh, uh, we can say that the first answer is correct. Uh, well, and finally, uh, uh, really the final point uh, here, uh, uh, the final point is, uh, the, the, of my presentation is whether uh, 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 we understand why Eastern Europe is important for Israel. 
or at least some Israelis, or substantial part of the Israelis. But now we have to understand whether Israel is anyhow important to Eastern Europe. And that might be uh, probably a background for presentation we'll hear tomorrow. Um, and, uh, in principle, at the moment, we could say that probably 10 years ago it was not so obvious, but at the, at the moment we can say that this text exactly so. Uh, Israel is important uh, uh, as something, uh, the country, uh, which provides an experience which could be utilized by many of the new old democracies uh, of East Central and Eastern Europe, like, right? like Ukraine, for instance. Yeah? Ukraine at the moment is interested in Israeli experience of building, building up of the high-tech economy, of the security, uh, of uh, uh, constructing of the liberal democracy without abandoning, uh, abandoning uh, its uh, ethnic national character, uh, the way of developing of the contemporary agriculture, uh, space industry, uh, and of course uh, defense forces and security forces, and so on and so forth. Sometimes it brings us to a very interesting situation, uh, meaning that uh, Israel provides uh, a number of allusions uh, to the current political and the military situation uh, Israel and, excuse me, Ukraine and Russia enjoy at the moment. Uh, it's very easy for me, for example, to explain Arab-Israeli conflict uh, to those who uh, uh, live in Ukraine. Uh, when they ask me, uh, what's the story? Judea, Samaria, uh, the, the, the Gaza Strait, what's the story? You know? Can you explain me? I said, it's, it's very easy. Uh, uh, Gaza Strip is premier, Judea and Samaria is Lugandonia, you know, it's uh, uh, um, uh, Lugansk People's Republic and Donetsk People's Republic, and everything is clear, you know. Uh, but uh, that means if Ukraine is uh, like uh, Israel, like Ukraine, everything is clear. But if uh, Israel like Russia, uh, uh, also in Russia, on the most of Moscow, St. Petersburg, people take these Israeli allusions. Uh, explaining the understanding that if uh, Russia like Israel, so Ukraine is actually part of the uh, 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 um, uh, lost motherland which is captured by the enemy, the uh, Arab world, you know. Uh, uh, so, uh, uh, and those were countries, imperialist countries, that are staying behind them. Uh, still, um, uh, uh, that might also influence the local jury. Uh, including the Russian jury and the Ukrainian jury. Uh, sometimes, uh, like we see in the Ukrainian case, uh, uh, Israel experience also uh, appended uh, to the vision of the local Jewish community. Uh, we see a lot here, you know, uh, especially after the revolution of dignity here in Ukraine, uh, how Israel, Israel was a symbol and Israel was a brand, you know. And this brand, uh, uh, as a result, uh, some of the uh, the outcomes of this brand was enjoyed by the local Jewish community. It happens also in Russia at the moment because the Russian uh, Israeli experience in security and conflict with the Muslim world was also the, on, on the demand in some circles of the Russian population. But uh, uh, also in Ukraine, although in Ukraine uh, the Ukrainian Jewish honeymoon didn't last long, but still we have some balanced relations. Uh, including the uh, place Israel enjoyed in there. In Russia, the reason, as you have, um, I would say, the, the, the anti Semitic festival uh, uh, after uh, the Russian plane was damaged to Syria by the Syrian forces, we understand that uh, it's much more complicated that place than, 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 uh, there than it is here. Uh, okay, so uh, I don't have uh, much time uh, to discuss other issues. Uh, but let me just show you one example of our recent uh, couple of our recent studies, uh, meaning whether uh, those who come from Eastern Europe, especially recently, uh, in the recent uh, um, two generations or one generation uh, of uh, Russian-speaking repatriates uh, coming from Russia, Ukraine, and so on and so forth, uh, how they uh, understand the current conflict between Russia and Ukraine. You can see here that in 2014, okay. If you will have a look at uh, 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 Israeli social media, especially its uh, Russian branch, Russian language branch, you will probably come to the conclusion that every Russian-speaking Israeli uh, uh, comes from bed in the morning and goes to bed in the evening uh, asking and trying to answer only one question, nothing else. Who is correct in this conflict, Russia or Ukraine? Ukraine uh, or 
uh, but if you will have a look at the result of this uh, sociological study we made uh, in 2014, you will see that only 10% uh, of the Russian-speaking Israelis, meaning those who came to Israel um, uh, starting from 1969 and uh, until uh, 2014, only 10% of them believe that uh, 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 they support either side and that Israel should interfere and support either side. At uh, that time, three years ago, four years ago, uh, about 40% they supported either side, uh, but uh, uh, according to their opinion, uh, Israel should not interfere into this conflict. And 50% were asking the question, where is Russia, where is Ukraine? Uh, what does it mean for me? Uh, okay, uh, three years later, our recent research, uh, uh, April 2017, uh, the trend is continuing. That time, uh, only 5%, twice less, uh, actually were active supporters of the either side. Uh, one third were passive supporters of the either side. And two thirds actually didn't support any, uh, any side or were not interested in all this issue. So, we actually are talking about uh, Russian speaking Israelis with the word Israelis, which, which is the most important one. But does it really mean that they became uh, universal Israelis and lost uh, their East European roots and some elements of their education and political culture? My answer is no. So, uh, to make long story short, I would say that Israeli society is actually was founded by East Europeans. Israeli society still have uh, many of elements of its political culture and the current trend in of Jewish immigration and re-establishment of Israeli establishment and re-establishment and development of the Israeli society would most probably uh, will bring us down and again to understanding what does Eastern Europe mean for Israel. Thank you so much. Questions, please. <laughs> I have just a couple you know, short questions. First one actually it's about uh, we have seen all the statistics of population of Israel uh, to this year, I think so, 2018. And um, it was mentioned such identity like Arabs, Arab Arabs and so on and so on. And uh, I'm sure you know it's, it's a very broad identity, a lot of people who speak different dialects of Arabic, you know, Bedouins, different tribes, clans, like so on. It's like very broad uh, stuff. And I met some people in Israel uh, who, speak, who actually speak in Arabic, uh, and they are from Galilee, uh, and they are, call themselves uh, uh, Aramid, you know, Aramid, 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 Aramid nation, yes. Aramid people, and um, but interesting because culturally they do not speak this language at all, and uh, for me it's, 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 it's a question uh, what's what's origin of this identity now in Israel? It's like initiative from state to create some new identity, like like it was attempt to do with uh, Christians, Arabic Christians, to write in uh, to that Zulut, not Havi but Nazri, you know, so some difference. Or it's like initiative from below, from these people. That's first question. The second one about. Um, Russian, so-called Russian Aliyah, you, you know it's about 300,000 of these people, according to al Khan, they are not Jew, Jewish. Do you have any research about their identity? How do they represent themselves? They have three books about them. <laughs> okay, uh, uh, so, uh, well, yes, uh, to make a long story short, I'm a little bit afraid that Alan would believe that I am uh, his client as an academic activist, but I have to answer this question. Uh, uh, so, uh, uh, well, in principle, I would say that uh, uh, let's start with the Arab-speaking population. Of course, it's not one unified ethnic group. Uh, they have at least uh, 15 or 17 uh, different sub-ethnic and ethnic uh, entities, and uh, uh, the current trend is to reform themselves into the different uh, uh, ethnicities. Uh, and the uh, Aramaic identity, meaning uh, Arab-speaking Christian identity, uh, is actually one of the steps uh, forward uh, in this way. Uh, uh, then we are talking about not only Druze and Charkas and Bedouins, but we are also talking about people who are actually of non-Arab origin at all. You probably know that about 30% of Israeli Arabs are actually not Arabs at all. They are Kurds, okay? Uh, according to their origin. Uh, on the way to my university in Ariel, 
uh, I'm going, uh, I'm you know passing by uh, Turmus Aya village, Arab village. What is Turmus Aya? Uh, the generation who spoke, uh, uh, who spoke uh, 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 Serb creation, actually, uh, they died recently. Okay, they actually the people who came from uh, uh, from uh, the Bosnia, uh, and on the other side. Uh, of the Kvish, you know, of the road. Uh, uh, you have uh, a settlement that was founded uh, sometimes in 11th or 12th century and people much more, much, look much more French than Arab at the moment. So, uh, the question is, it's a question political. Israeli government for many years was, was interested to have one address while talking about Arab-speaking population. Uh, and uh, all the ideas, you know, to separate the identities of the political question and the uh, uh, Jewish majority leadership was not interested in that. Uh, at the moment, the situation, uh, the situation changed. Uh, and of course, probably the uh, understanding, uh, accepting of the Aramaic identity is just the beginning. Um, uh, your next question concerning the those who are not Jews according to Allah, uh, it's, uh, uh, it, it, it comes from time to time this discussion here, what should we do with these people? Uh, and uh, whether they are Jewish or whether they are not, you know. And uh, uh, my opinion is I belong to the majority of the Israeli society, which, belong to, which uh, believes that uh, this group should be integrated within the Jewish collective. We don't have a luxus, you know, we don't have... Uh, uh, um, uh, we, we, we needn't establish another ethnic group in the situation that Israel exists at the moment, yeah? Uh, uh, and uh, finally, which is most important, yeah, it, that's a religious decision, that's a religious approach, how you define these people. Uh, but, but before uh, putting them in, into, certain, uh, into a certain point, into a certain corner, why should you ask them? Uh, I asked uh, several times, and many of my colleagues did. And actually, uh, the, the majority of these people, they feel not just Israeli, 95% feel Israeli. From this point of view, it's fine, but more than 70% feel Jewish. Uh, uh, when you ask these people uh, whether you are in favor or against of uh, implementing the so-called civil marriage, non-religious marriage in Israel, 90% uh, of them, yes, we would like that Israel will enjoy the civil marriage. This next question, regardless you answer to the first question, what sort of marriage you want for yourself, your children, and for your grandchildren? We are talking about non-Jews according to Allah. 55% prefer the religious Jewish ceremony. So uh, that means that the, the process is going on. They're integrating within the Jewish, Israeli Jewish collective. Yeah? And if uh, Israel will implement the same policy, like in 1960s or 1970s, that those who are non Jews according to Allah, they very quickly became Jewish and nobody remember who was actually came from, you know, that will be really fine. Okay, but uh, that time, how uh, would put it? Uh, Rabinat was Zionist. <coughs> Thank you.